<laughs> well, I now know all the ways in which I should be worried and concerned that I didn't know prior to today, so thank you for that. <laughs> um, and now, Dominique, it's over to you, and uh, help us understand how we should be communicating about thank this Thank you. I don't know if I'm going to do that, but I have to say I was a little disappointed because I was told that Fred was going to do some interpretive dancing to explain to us how <laughs> Gene Drive was working. But maybe that's for next Sackler Symposium, next right? <laughs> so my pleasure being here today, and thank you for staying around for so such a long day. It's been a very uh, uh, challenging, I think, and hopefully intellectually stimulating in two days. A little hard for me to actually wrap up and say, oh, wow, and so I'm going to explain everything that we haven't explained the rest of the days with such a tricky uh, case study. But I'm going to try then to bring it back to broader questions by addressing gene drives, the media, and society. So as you see, I'm not scared in 10 minutes to actually tackle complicated topics here. So gene drives. So let's step back a little bit and think in terms of what Pam and friend had told, told us here, and think also of other issues we have seen develop in the public discourse, in the public realm as far as a controversial scientific topic. And this goes back to something that Fred and I discussed at length when we served on the genetic engineering crop report that Marsha mentioned early on. And we're thinking of talking about risk assessment. A purely technical assessment of risk can answer very well the wrong question. And that's the issue that we have with what we call post-normal science. When, you know, let's say in the old days when science was produced and potentially with risky consequences, applied science could help actually assess risk that was related to that science. When the stakes become more complex, higher, and the uncertainty related to the systems at play are also higher, then you may potentially call on professional consultancy to help you solve those issues and assess risk in a good way. However, However, when you're in a post-normal type of approach, when it's not only technical, it's legal, moral, social, cultural implications of the technology that are at play, is it a new role for scientists to play, a new role for the media to play, and how society makes those decisions? This is what we're discussing today, and I think this is the stake of what Pam and Fred were, were uh, mentioning. So yes, so the media has a role to play, the scientists have a role to play, but it's not the media anymore. I call it the not so new media, media environment, that also called the cyber new world of uh, science communication. Why do I say that? Because the rules of the game have changed. First of all, we've seen it, and uh, Fred has a, a mention, as Pam too, with the case study of what's happening in the last two days. Scientists more and more are communicating directly with their audiences, and they are doing so by using social media environment, and doing so, so sometimes before their research has been peer reviewed and published. We haven't talked about this in this forum. I think it's crucial to talk about it. Do scientists have actually the ethical you know, uh, dilemma to to communicate with the public when they think this is something that's present, that actually has a lot of public consequences, or do they not? Do media actually have a responsibility to not actually you know, report on those issues before peer review, or should they? These are actually questions we have to address, and we have scientific organizations, media organizations, and so on, ponder and actually critical address. The second thing is, let's face it, Commercial media you know, have changes, the rules have changes. The rule is to actually attract audiences. We want people to click on our headlines, therefore the headlines may be a little more, let's say, sensational than they should be. This is because we want to incentivize audiences to click on our articles. Neurocasting, the fact that people you know, will be exposed to things that actually fit their point of view, is actually coming common norm. We are testing headlines to see which one people are going to click on, and so on. Algorithms are used also to actually make people you know, uh, uh, access news that they are uh, uh, likely to like. And I, I'm turning to Dietram Scharfler here, who wrote an excellent piece with Matt Nisbet about this issue. So I'm not going to go into details about that. And finally, what we know also is that social cues in social media platforms, I'm talking about the fact that people like, comment, share, 
will actually influence wha how like an excellent reporter may say on a media platform. And we reported actually a couple of years ago in this uh, forum, uh, our research on nasty effect of comments uh, that actually led popular science magazine to close down the comments and so on. I'm not gonna reopen this kind of form. But we need to think about these topics as we think about this case study. So what did we have? perfect case study for the new world of science communication and the necessity to think about it and potentially have guidelines, ethical guidelines for all of us. A scientist communicated directly with the public. He started on Twitter. You can see that here he doesn't have a lot of followers. I'm showing here. Uh, 1,000 followers, Kevin Hasveld, but he did actually, you know, publish those perspectives and so on. That was taken by actually a prominent reporter, Carl Zimmer, on New York Times. Well, you know, let's face it, who reads the New York Times? People like us here. I don't think the majority of the American public cares about Carl, what Carl Zimmer says. I've told him that before, by the way, he was not, but this is actually the reality of the, you know, the, the new media environment. And so he also posted it on Twitter, as you can see. He has certainly more followers. But again, most likely, people like uh, you and I in this room. Well, uh, we went to Wire magazine, but Wire had like, a different audience, younger, male, and interested in technology and so on. And this model, actually, Fred, you don't read this model, but my, my students do. And they, it is actually, you know, quaker related uh, platform that actually people interested in science fiction and weird science and so on. So it's going around networks and potentially impacted audiences. So will they impact audience? There's a lot that we know about how media effects impact audiences. I'm not gonna do that again today. I actually, we have a research group, Science Media and the Public, with a lot of publications, uh, and please go and see what's interesting to you. But what I would say though, at the societal level, is that we have data, at least on the American public, because indeed this is culturally relevant. And Fred was mentioning that, that New Zealand was related to, the, to the, the gene drive issue we're talking about. Well, New Zealand has totally banned genetic engineering from uh, their, their territory. So the, the context of deploying gene drive in New Zealand is certainly different from uh, happening in the United States. So we collected data recently, unfortunately, not directly on gene drive, but this is data from six months ago, asking what Americans thought about editing genes in wildlife population. And what we saw here to the question, does editing gene in wildlife population messes up with nature? You can see here that more than 60% of the American public, again, a, a, a representative sample of the population, thinks that it messes up with nature. And also 60% agree it allows human to play God. Going more in detail into this data, asking the question, editing gene in wildlife to decrease or eliminate local population of animals or plants that are causing environmental problem is morally acceptable. You see that actually, almost a normal curve here, that 30% do not know, basically, but then you have here close to 30% to actually disagree. So there is that moral component. It's not about risk assessment. It's not about knowing or not if he's the, the, the thing that will, you know, uh, have risky consequences. It's a moral issue for the American population. And this is not very surprising because we know that risk and benefits of a new technology such as dim drives depends on the different components. At the broader level, it's really, excuse me, related to the social, political, and cultural context. So this means that even California context is very different, let's say, than the Wisconsin context. What's the industry? What's like the farmer population? How people relate to their food, etc. New Zealand certainly is different from the, the, the American context and so on for regulation, institutional uh, uh, you know, rules, things such as religiosity and so on. And I think Ditcham also show us some data on human gene editing that confirm the importance of the moral component when you think of gene editing in this country. Information climate, we have talked about potential media coverage impacting you know, uh, people's attitude, but let's think again. We may think that what's happening in the last two days is actually extremely important and will impact public opinion. Most likely it's not. 
Most likely this is something that actually impacts us here in this room. As far as how much it will impact, uh, let's say, a large segment of the population, this is an empirical question that I hope we can answer with data if somebody gives us money to read like, your card, just joking. And that, but that's definitely an empirical question that will take a while. Public opinion doesn't actually change you know, in a way that's durable from one day to the other. Because individual characteristics here that actually people use to make sense of complex science with the picture in their heads, with the trust that they have in who gives the information, with all the values they bring to the table, and deference to scientific authority being an important one, will color, obviously, how they're going to make sense to this issue. And right now, most people don't know much and they rely on those heuristics, such as what they think already about genetic engineering. And just to conclude, give you an example of how this can be you know, shaped by other elements that the one we may think. We did some research with the uh, uh, University of Pennsylvania, I think some colleagues here in the room, that we, put, we presented at the Society of Risk Analysis uh, last February. And we looked at the role of the perceived risk of genetic engineering in mosquitoes for people actually thinking that was a good way to combat Zika. And this is a very bad way to finish my talk, which is a super long sentence. Please never do that in science communication. So the, the using genetic engineering mosquitoes as a method to reduce the threat of Zika is one circumstance under which Americans who would otherwise be reluctant to support genetic engineering may be willing to accept it as a solution to a public health problem that might personally affect them. So in plain language, if I think I'm going to get Zika and you give me that stuff instead of straight bad stuff, I take it. So really, that was basically the, the take home message. Concluding really is that we need to go back to that excellent report that did point to the importance of public engagement. And this is not like a, a empty, I would say, call, because at the end of the day, it's not only a technical issue. Thank you. <laughs>